You're listening to As Read By Me, the podcast where writers read and readers listen. Greetings, Earthlings. It's fellow human Dave Stiles here, and this week we're celebrating our home planet with all Earth Day-inspired pieces. First up is Paul Camerata with a poem entitled Johnny Cork for Brains Goes Green. Then Melinda Gordon is back to read her story about attending the very first Earth Day, entitled The Day I Learned Who I Am. And finally, Mike Archer swoops in with some surprising information about the American bald eagle in Shoot to Kill. Okay, pull up a patch of grass. It's story time. And hey, clean up your trash when you leave, will you? Hi, I'm Paul Camerata, and this is Johnny Cork for Brains Goes Green, as read by me. Johnny Cork for Brains wanted to do his part to help dear Mother Earth, but he didn't know where to start. The word I hear people say lots is renewable, but never when it comes to something that is chewable. What's something eatable to take in this green direction? Perhaps a sweet tooth tickler, an eco smart confection. While he ruminated, John on peanut butter snacked, his spoon between his mouth and jar returning up and back. Then all at once it struck, the answer's in my hand. And grabbing pen and paper, Johnny sketched his planet plan. Scoop yourself some yummy stuff, then dip your spoon again. Congrats, you just helped save a bit of this old globe, my friend. Because this is no plain dessert, the kind you eat then stop. No, this is the green heaven scent, renewable lollipop. Like regrown crab or lobster claws, shark teeth or centipede feet, it's the perpetual motion machine of candy, the solar power of sweets. Maybe smeared with peanut butter, then in chocolate morsels coated, a one-handed candy snack that can always be reloaded. In love with his plan, like always, was Johnny Cork for Brains, and how now nature and taste buds would both by the spoonful gain. A simple recipe by which the sweet train needn't stop. A gift from Johnny to our world. The Renewable Lollipop. Hi, I'm Melinda Gordon, and this is the day I learned who I am, as read by me. Today is Wednesday, April 22nd, 1970, and I'm not in school. Instead, I'm sitting in the passenger seat of my friend Ted Galanti's dad's car, riding toward Fairmount Park in Philadelphia. The back seat is filled with our other two friends, Larry and Dave, and a whole bunch of snacks and jackets and umbrellas and thermoses that our moms made us take just in case we might need them. It's a little stuffy in the car, with the fresh air being replaced by the teenage sense of anticipation, sneakers, and gum. I'll be 15 in a month, but the boys are already 16, so they can drive. We all have permission slips with us from our parents and our 10th grade world cultures teacher in case anybody wants to know why we're not in class. My dad said that there might be a lot of policemen there and that we should steer clear if we can. These days, he said, the police are not always friends to teenagers or people who look different than them. Our teacher, Mr. Pezza, said the same thing but in more careful words when he taught us about sit-ins and protests and activism. I'm allowed to go to this because my parents want me to be an active citizen. You should always be a supporter of good causes and good people, they said. I'm trying, but sometimes other kids think I'm a weirdo for even talking about current events and making changes in the world. Those kids are more interested in dating and sports and parties and so on, but I'm not. Mostly because, well, I'm 14. Today, we're going to a teach-in. It's important work, and I'm excited. I'm jumping around in my seat a little, and I feel kind of sick. It's really happening. We're on our way, and we'll be there soon. I'm singing along with the radio, trying to swallow the lump in my throat. 
I have a little suede pouch full of dimes for the phone, $20, paper and pencils, and a list of phone numbers in my green army bag. I'm wearing bell-bottom jeans, a paisley shirt, and fringe moccasins. My Cinderella watch is in the bag, too. I'm prepared. Suddenly, we're in a long line on a sandy, dusty road. At the end of the road is a huge parking lot, almost all filled up with cars, campers, trucks, you name it. Some have banners or flags attached to them, and some have painted sayings right on the cars. Crowds of people are passing us, all different ages, different colors, smiling, carrying guitars, holding posters, holding hands. It's a beautiful blend heading toward a common goal. Today, we're going to learn how to save the earth. Swept up in the rainbow of color, sounds, and scents, we're flowing into the park, and I get the mystical, magical knowledge that there's something wonderful happening. My eyes are wide, my brain is humming, and my heart is pounding. Music is everywhere. There are booths set up all around, people selling buttons and crafts and posters, groups sitting in circles having discussions, musicians playing and singing, artists creating. There's a calming feel in the air, along with the wonderful smells of cooking and patchouli and something else that I don't know. But together... It all forms a light purple concoction of a feeling that I really want to be part of. I'm so curious, and my goal today is to learn not only about the environment, but about the people. My brain is exploding, and I know that I'm staring rudely, but I can't help it. A song breaks out in my head, almost bringing me to tears. Beautiful people, you live in the same world as I do. But somehow I never noticed you before today, I'm ashamed to say. Walking around some more, I'm learning and gathering information and buying buttons and talking to older kids, college kids, and adults. They're very gentle and kind and seem happy to answer questions without getting impatient. Excuse me, what? Allen Ginsberg is reading at the podium? Point me that way, please. Ralph Nader is speaking? If I was old enough to vote, I'd vote for him. I pin a campaign button onto my bag right next to the little one with the green and white logo on it and move on. I'm floating now. The disc jockey in my head has changed the record. Do you believe in magic in a young girl's heart? how the music can free her whenever it starts, and it's magic if the music is groovy. It makes you feel happy like an old-time movie. I'll tell you about the magic. It'll free your soul. But it's like trying to tell a stranger about rock and roll. Time has passed way too quickly, and it's almost time for me to meet my friends to head home. Our parents didn't want us on the highway at rush hour. I don't want to leave. I want to run away with this beautiful circus. My friends are exactly where we agreed to meet. They seem tired and ready to go, but there's a keynote speaker and we'll miss him. Come on, guys. I have no choice but to follow them and maybe hope to see Senator Muskie on TV later. My parents would be interested too. So now I'm dragging my dusty, dirty moccasins through the field on our way out, but I can't stop looking back. There they are, the people that are going to change the world. I'm going to do it too. I'll be a teacher and I'll be kind and open and encouraging and I'll never say no to a new idea. I want to stand on the top of a hill and shout, I'm Melinda Patrice Borak and these are my people. But I do it in my head. I don't want to talk on the way home. My eyes are closed and I'm dreaming, but I'm not sleeping. The background music for my dreams today plays softly against the slideshow of what I've seen and heard. Harmony and understanding, sympathy and trust abounding, no more falsehoods or derisions, golden living dreams of visions, mystic crystal revelation and the mind's true liberation. Aquarius, 
Aquarius, the first Earth Day, April 22nd, 1970. I will never stop honoring it. Hi, this is Mike Archer. This is a piece from my blog, thearcherjournal.com, called Shoot to Kill, as read by me. The bald eagle, our national bird, is everywhere. It's on the Great Seal of the United States. It was adopted as the emblem of the country in 1787. It's on every $1 bill, coins, and passports. It's up there with the flag, Liberty Bell, and Statue of Liberty as a universal symbol of American strength. It has been a sign of government authority since the Roman Empire. The bald eagle has survived despite man's carelessness that almost wiped it out of existence. Overdevelopment into their natural habitat, hunting and pesticides, made them an endangered species for years. The number of adult breeding bald eagles in the United States and Canada has dropped by 2.9 billion since 1970. Rachel Carson's Silent Spring in 1962 led to the banning of the pesticide DDT 10 years later. It was not only killing animals like the bald eagle, but contaminating soil and water for decades. Conservation efforts have increased the bald eagle population from just 417 nesting pairs in 1963 to more than 71,000 nesting pairs and an estimated 316,000 individual birds in the lower 48. But there is something that is threatening that population, lead bullets. A recent story by the Philadelphia Inquirer reported on a Cornell study published in the Journal of Wildlife Management that shows lead ingestion by bald eagles has reduced their population growth every year by 6% for males, 4% for females. The study covers 30 years. The study was done in seven northeastern states, including New Jersey. Pennsylvania ranks number six in the country in gross cost for hunting licenses. So if you can't hunt bald eagles, how do they get lead poisoning? When hunters kill their prey, they often field dress their kill and leave some remains behind that are contaminated by the lead bullets. Even the remains of animals like raccoons and groundhogs shot with lead bullets can cause lead poisoning on the bald eagles that feed on the remains. There is a solution, copper bullets. They are just as effective. Some hunters argue they are more expensive. But there are hunters who want to solve the problem. The website huntingwithnonlead.org promotes the benefits of copper bullets over lead. You may be asking, why should we care? Two years ago, I wrote about how the federal government issued a clarification of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. It eliminated criminal penalties for incidental deaths of migratory birds that happened in the course of normal business. The government stopped investigating bird deaths. According to a New York Times investigation, as long as a company or local government doesn't mean to kill the birds as a result of developments, it's okay. With a new administration, the Interior Department revoked these ridiculous changes last October. Protecting the environment is one of the critical issues facing us all. Denying an obvious problem or not caring will not make it disappear. Rachel Carson warned us decades ago. She said, The road we have been traveling is deceptively easy, a smooth superhighway in which we progress with great speed, but in its end lies disaster. The other fork of the road, the one less traveled by, offers our last, our only chance to reach a destination that assures the preservation of the earth. When we shoot to kill, we must understand the consequences. Thanks for joining us. And if you want to do something to help the planet that requires no new taxes and no laws to be passed, try reducing your plastic consumption and stop using Roundup, a.k.a. glyphosate. The plastic we throw away that finds its way into our roadsides and into our waterways will take at least 500 years to break down. 500 years! And glyphosate is already harming every living organism on the planet. So let's not wait 10 more years for them to ban it, like DDT. Let's stop using it now. There are plenty of natural ways to curb weeds and pests. And trust me, every squirt out of the Roundup bottle finds its way back to you and increases your chances of cancer and other diseases more with each passing year. 
Have a great week. Be kind to the earth and each other.